Hello, welcome to Behavioral Health Case Management, BEH 215. Today we're going to be discussing behavioral health and social services management structures. It does not sound that sexy, but I promise you it is filled with wonderful information. So let's start off with managers and they're responsible for the goals of the organization. So that's the primary duty for most managers. The goals and objectives that govern behavioral health and social work are organized to make them run efficiently. So it's not accidental that these settings are often referred to as organizations. Good managers are organized themselves, and they also recognize the importance of organizing the work environment of others. They do this so that, number one, the activities of staff members are coordinated and integrated, and two, it makes their own jobs easier. The key here is when you have organization, you are going to be forgiven a lot of other mistakes because people trust you when you're organized. They trust that you know what you're doing. If you're completely disorganized, people just get weary and afraid that this is going to be a catastrophe. So one of the other major things that are done is creating manageable work units. And in most human service organizations, one of the most important organizing tasks of top managers entails forming these manageable size units. Organizational structures and the organizational charts that are used to describe them range from flat to tall. In a very flat organization re with relatively few staff members and few, if any, hierarchical levels. There are few formal guides, such as p rules, policies, and procedures, and loose supervision of day-to-day -day activities. Roles may be blurred. Tasks are often undertaken by any individual available to perform them. So in this kind of perspective, you might have a manager and then the big boss, and everybody else is kind of still at that baseline area. You don't see a lot of layers of management above you. Whereas in a tall organizational structure, which is what much more common, and you usually see these in large public welfare agencies or comprehensive medical settings, there are likely to be many staff members in a complex organizational hierarchy portrayed in an organizational chart, not cart, chart with many levels. Supervision is tighter too. Everyone knows or should know what their job is and what is not a part of it and there is more specialization. In taller organizations, upper level managers cannot possibly manage the entire organization themselves. And a solution is to divide the organization into subunits. The units need to be small enough to be effectively managed by one individual. This is the organizational activity generally referred to as departmentalization. The book also refers to it as departmentation, which I prefer departmentalization. It's a better word. Anyway, it refers to the groupings of people and their activities along some basic pattern or model in order that their activities can be adequately supervised, coordinated, and managed. So here's a um, picture of what you would see a flat organization versus a tall organization. Tall organization has seven layers and that means that at least five of those layers are probably management whereas a flat organization may only have two levels of management and as such it is easier to work with people in that kind of environment. However, the bigger the company the more likely you need that tall structure. Kuntz, O'Donnell, and Weirich, in their classic text on business management, suggest many different ways that a manager can choose to handle the task of departmentalization. They provide a social work and behavioral health managers with a variety of viable options for subdividing and organizing staff members. So we're going to go over several of these, and then we're going to talk about the pros and cons. So first we have simple numbers. Units consist of equal numbers of staff members all having similar knowledge and skills and all performing the same functions or serving similar clients. 
and I'm going to go, as I said before, I'm going to go into more detail when we get to the pros and cons. Time worked. Units consist of staff members from different professional disciplines who have in common the time of day, i.e. their shift, that they work. So everybody on the midnight shift, everybody on the morning shift, everyone on the afternoon shift. Then number three is discipline in an organization containing several different professional types. Units consist of persons grouped together solely because they are members of the same professional discipline. So for example, in a hospital, you might have all of the nurses being managed by a nurse manager. You might have the counselors being managed by um, a doctor of psychotherapy or a psychiatrist, but the discipline divides how the workload or how the uh, managers identify who works work for them. Then we have enterprise, which are units consist of all persons engaged in the same enterprise activity regardless of discipline. Service to clients generally is just one of these enterprises. So let's go back to the hospital and um, you're working in the mental health facility and with you are nurses and doctors, clerks, uh, insurance bill billing people, all of those people might be seen as one unit because they all belong to that one speci sp specified area. Then we have territory served, which is units consist of all staff members who serve the same geographical territory. A lot of times you're going to see, um, especially in nursing and physical therapy, out calls where you are a visiting nurse or a visiting physical physical therapist or physical therapist assistant and you go to visit people at their homes and basically you work within a 25 mile range so in that kind of regard all of the people who are outside workers might be consisting of people who work in New Jersey versus people who work in Pennsylvania versus people who work in Maryland etc. Number six, service offered. Units consist of staff members, all of whom offer the same type of specialized service to clients with a variety of presenting problems. So you might have a group of nurses who all work with their patients on wound care, and that is their specific department or their departmentalization. Client problem. Different units consist of staff members who specialize in offering a variety of services to clients who share a single diagnostic category or who share a common problem. Number eight, multidisciplinary teams in an organization serving clients with different types of problems. Units consist of staff members from different professional backgrounds who offer a variety of services. And finally, marketing channels. These are units cons consisting of staff members who all offer services, usually information, within similar types of settings or through similar means. So let's start looking at the pros and cons of these methods. We're going to start with the simple numbers method and that's where you may have five manager and each manager has ten employees who fall under them. And it's not divided by any specialization other than just numbers. And the biggest drawback is its lack of, lack of recognition of the individual capacities of staff members and the uniqueness of their job responsibilities. The simple numbers model is best suited to forming work groups of employees who are semi-skilled or unskilled and whose jobs are relatively simple and standardized. Historically and today, it is a common organizational method employed by the military. And what you're going to see in that little chart I have there is an organizational chart and you'll see the number of people who work in each of those organizations pieces and it's supposed to at least provide a balance of how many people are working in each area so when you are looking at simple numbers it's good for very low skilled work that you need very tight discipline with Then there's the time worked method, you know, everybody who's on the same shift, so to speak. And the greatest disadvantage of grouping staff members by time worked relates to its potential to fragment the organization. Medical and psychiatric facilities, crisis centers, and many other 
organizations cannot limit client services to the 9 to 5 Monday through Friday model. They function 24-7. You can never roll up to University of Pennsylvania Hospital and they say, sorry, we're closed. They are always open. A lack of cooperation and communication between shifts can be problematic because people become very attached to their shift and they want their shift to be better than the other shifts. You'll see on the right hand side, I have a little chart of a worksheet that the different shifts, nursing shifts and CNA shifts would fill out about medications and um, when the CNA went in to check on the patient. This is supposed to give each shift a base level understanding of what's going on with this patient. And if the facility is not following up well, then what you see is these kind of sheets are not available. But these really work very well for shift work. Cons of specialization method. In a large community mental health care center, there might be one or more units of just behavioral health workers, one or more units of nurses, and so forth. Departmentalization by discipline is a time-honored tradition within many human service organizations. A weakness of this way of organizing staff members into units is that it may deprive them of regular interaction with staff members from other di disciplines who might have a different perspective on situations and from whom they might learn. So if the nurses are in one area and the physical therapy and physical therapy assistants are in another area, there's not much overlap. And when you don't have a lot of overlap, the information is not really getting shared as efficiently as it could. The pros and cons of the enterprise method. For profit corporations often group employees by enterprise, that is according to their major activity. For example, production, sales, finance, human resources. Um, you could look at any number of different departments and understand that this department that does sales, whether you're selling door-to-door -door in the neighborhood or selling large quantities of an item through wholesale markets, all those salespeople are going to be grouped together. To group people by enterprise function is to recognize that there is value in working with others who share many of the same knowledge and skills, and they are then judged by similar standards no matter what their academic preparation or professional identification. A major advantage to enterprise function departmentalization lies in its potential to create an esprit de corps among staff members within each en enterprise. Esprit de corps is a French phrase that basically means um, a team feeling, a sense of collectivity in terms of get every working together to get something done. People may have widely varying backgrounds academically but have similar interests, otherwise known as kindred spirits, and they work together toward achievement of similar and or shared goals. The con, if people become too territorial or too obsessed with their own unit success, sometimes at the expense of the success of other units, organizational goal achievement can be jeopardized. So again, you know, you have to remember that you're working for the organization and not just for your subunit because ultimately the subunit is a cog in a much larger machine. Pros and cons of the territorial method. Satellite clinics of a community health mental health center might divide up client services by the place of residence of potential clients. If they live in one place, they are served by clinic A. If they live one block over, they have to be seen at clinic B. The respective territories are sometimes referred to as catchment areas in the mental health field. So the pros, questions relative to the issue of whose job is it are less likely to occur than if other methods of departmentation are used. The con is a disadvantage of territory departmentalization is uneven division of work among staff members. No matter how much planning goes into creating territories, Workload is rarely ever in balance for a long period of time. 
Inevitably, one territory can produce a work overload for one staff member while simultaneously another staff member serving a different, tor different territory will not have enough to do. So again, one of the major roles of a manager is to try and be as fair as possible. But it's not always the case because even in the healthcare field, we are subject to the demands of the marketplace. And supply and demand comes down to the idea that if people are much more interested in getting uh, physical workups by nurses than they are getting physical therapy, you're going to see the nurses much busier than the physical therapy people. Um, and again, you know, it's always going to be a give and take because one week the nurses could be running around and the following week the PTAs are running around. So it's always a different kind of context depending on the environment. So let's look at the pros and cons of services offered. Often in a, a manager in a family services agency will divide services into individual treatment, group treatment, family counseling, and case management. Consequently, the manager will have reasonable expectation that staff members within these specializations will become very knowledgeable about and skilled in what they do. If you're doing the same thing every day over and over again, you're going to become really good at it. So the pros are you know, you have a greater mastery of the knowledge and skills needed to offer that service effectively. Also, clients in an organization whose staff members are organized by services offered have the benefits of having the services of a specialist. The con is the narrowness of a staff member's tasks is also the greatest disadvantage of service offered method. Additionally, in the cons of services offered method. Needed information may not be readily shared. The development of a sense of a team, one that includes people in different areas of specialization, may not occur. A lack of diversity in their workday can become tedious and may lead to burnout or compassion fatigue. And, you know, compassion fatigue is when the most empathetic person in the world just feels like telling their clients to get over themselves. And, of course, that is definitely not okay, too. <laughs> Departmentalization by services offered might also result in an inefficient use of professional staff members within the organization. For example, there may be a waiting list of clients requiring the specialized services of those professionals who offer only group services, while the family treatment specialist might be experiencing a lull in the services or vice versa. So when we think about how we create these subunits, we also have to take into account how do we balance workloads? How do we predict supply and demand? And that is why being a manager can be a very difficult job. So let's look at pros and cons of client problem method. One unit might consist of all professional staff who specialize in the treatment of substance abuse. Another unit might consist of all staff members who work with clients with a certain group of related DSM-5 diagnoses or who deal with problems encountered by children who are victims of child abuse and neglect and so forth. So a pro, it is assumed that clients in the same diagnostic category or with similar problems will share many of the same service needs. The con is if a client's primary problem is not identified correctly Staff members can find themselves either working with problems in which they lack specialized knowledge and skills, or the client has to be transferred to another specialist who works with their newly identified primary problem. So, you know, again, when we look at all of these methods, there's pros and cons because depending on the situation, they either work really, really well, or they fall apart depending on the supply and demand that is being identified. So let's look at multiple multidisciplinary teams. Both are seen most frequently in hospitals and other organizations that offer mental health and health services. This model of departmentalization, sometimes called the interprofessional model, has been in place in many mental health settings and other organizations for many years and has seemed to work quite well. So the model and this is a model of a um, full service situation. Um, you have rehab, rehabilitation, social worker, surgeon, medical oncologist, 
radiation oncologists, nursing counselors, and these would be all people who work on a patient with cancer. So there's all these people who work as a team to help this one person get better. The pro is that it's inherent advantage of exposing staff to the knowledge and skills of other disciplines on a regular basis. The con is there are likely to be a work distribution inequities and morale problems among team members, primarily because of the persistence of status and power differentials. So for example, the oncologist or the surgeon may see themselves as way more important to the team than the social worker or the counselor. And you know, they define their value their way. Whereas, you know, somebody who is a counselor may define their value in the opposite way. They're much more important than the surgeon who never even gets to know the patient. So there's a lot of back and forth in teams that can lead to problems. So marketing channels method. What are the various channels that might be used to market HIV or AIDS awareness? What they could, what might they be? The public school system, the military, social media, or the religious community could all be different channels used to accomplish the same objective. And when we think of channels, we want to think of ways. These are how um, we get the, the information out there. The methods used would vary greatly based on political issues, characteristics of those who are the target of efforts to educate, and other factors. So if you're trying to get people to uh, use a condom, you may not want to go to an elementary school because parents are going to, might have a fit. But if you go to a high school, it would certainly be um, definitely age appropriate, even though parents will still have a fit sometimes. Um, then you have other issues like uh, the political issues of the Affordable Health Care Act and pre-existing conditions. So how do you work with that kind of uh, information? And that's something that is greatly appreciated by the vast majority of Americans is the idea that you cannot be turned down for insurance because of a pre-existing condition as of right now. So the pros, specialists assigned to work within one market channel would get to know and understand a particular market. And since a certain level of trust, acceptance, and rapport would have to be developed to be able to get through to those who are most at risk. So if you have somebody who is a reformed heroin user and they have gone back to school and gotten their degree in behavioral health, that might be a good person to utilize in an addictions environment because they've been there. They have credibility. They know what it's like. Now the cons is it has limited applicability to human services organizations. Many programs and services offered by social workers and other health professionals are not seen as appropriate candidates for multiple marketing channels for reasons of efficiency, professional ethics, tradition, and all too often inflexibility. Mental health providers are still reluctant to offer many programs and services anywhere but within the physical confines of an office. So when we look at mental health providers, you know, one of the biggest issues is that privacy. That idea that whatever I say to a counselor or whatever they say to their therapist is going to be kept confidential. If this goes outside of the office, how do we look at confidentiality, which is the highest point of our professional ethic in this particular field? So again, there's a lot of tradition that's built in and the younger generation has to figure out how to work outside the box. So let's go back to our flat versus tall organizations. It is not at all unusual for a tall organization to have two or even several ways of organizing its staff members into work groups. There is nothing wrong with this. In fact, since all of the methods for departmentalization that we have discussed seem to work better in some situations than in others, we should expect to see this occur. There are other issues that managers must consider when working towards the organizational goals. So just creating the subunits is the first part. Then moving forward, you have to have certain skill sets that will allow you to succeed as a manager. Time management, so important, cannot stress this enough. Managers both know how to manage their own time well and model time management for their subordinates. 
they know how to rank order their tasks so that they can focus most of their energies on the most important ones the ones that must be completed first and so forth so if you look at the bottom right hand side you'll see the one two three four um, system of management you know short-term crises and problems number one number two long-term strategic goals number three you want urgent but not important and number four not important and not urgent so you look at it's like triaging your to-do list every day what has to be done immediately what can wait plan ahead allow enough time to perform important tasks because unanticipated problems and delays occur frequently it's inevitable meet deadlines and regularly remind others to stay on track keep up with information ie phone calls electronic communication as it is received this can be very challenging some people might get 200 or 300 emails in a day and trying to stay on top of that is again very very challenging so in using the prioritization method again what you want to do is you want to look at did you get emails from your boss emails from your clients emails that are just junk you just delete those you want to be able to manage all of the stuff being thrown at a daily basis because if you get overwhelmed you're not going to be successful at any part of your job finally delegate tasks that are of lower priority to others whenever possible managers who organize their time well are able to be supportive of their staff members and to be available when needed but at the same time they are able to isolate themselves when they have work to be done that only they can do time management is especially important for human service managers because they so often must operate under time pressures they sometimes find themselves facing nearly impossible deadlines and you know some people say well that's not fair but the reality is no matter what job you have they're going to have extremely high expectations for how much you can get done and their perspective a lot of times is if you can't get it done in the time allotted maybe we can find somebody else so it really does demand that you put as much effort and time into those specific tasks that are you know on a really fixed deadline as possible the manager might have to drop everything to write and submit a proposal that if funded could ensure the financial survival of the organization or at least the continued employment of all current staff so managers have more than just organizational responsibilities they can oftentimes have the responsibility of keeping the business going and you know employees don't always demonstrate gratitude they don't always demonstrate appreciation they will however demonstrate anger and resentment if they feel that they are not being appreciated so being a manager is not an easy task and it can get more and more difficult with the number of people that you supervise now we're moving on to delegation managers often cannot perform every task that technically falls within their job descriptions managers must delegate the authority necessary to complete a task that they have delegated it lets the person act for the manager by having the same rights and privileges in a limited sphere as the manager so who is held accountable for the performance or non-performance of a delegated task or the quality of its performance under conditions of appropriate delegation of tasks managers can legitimately hold their subordinates responsible to them for their completion but the question of ultimate responsibility for delegated tasks is another matter in the broadest sense a manager can delegate a task but not the ultimate responsibility for its completion in some ways delegation brings more responsibility to the manager not less so if you delegate a task to one of your uh, subordinates or one of the people who work for you and they don't do it or they don't do it very well ultimately you're going to be held responsible because you're the manager and you need to make sure that they're doing their job and doing the task that you've assigned them so let's talk about the type of authority people have within human service organizations different types of authority can exist 
It is the authority legitimized by the organization to make certain decisions and to engage in certain activities that exist because of one's job position and its relation to other job positions. The formal organizational chart displays the authority legitimized by the organization, who has the authority to make certain decisions, to tell others what to do and how to do it, and what not to do. So, you know, when we look at the different responsibilities and elements of being a manager, you know, they have to have the authority, they're held accountable, and they must be responsible for what they are doing. So let's look at staff authority. When managers decide to delegate tasks and the authority to complete them, they have two options, staff authority and functional authority. People who have been assigned some task and been given staff authority are expected to collect information for the purpose of giving advice and recommendations to the manager, usually about some decision that he or she will have to make. With staff authority, advice or recommendations are supposed to be the end product of the subordinate's research and investigation. At the point that advice is given, the delegated task is completed. Staff authority is most frequently seen in large organizations, particularly in bureaucracies. It is frequently used in the military and in government circles. They give advice or recommendations, but do not expect to get credit or take the blame for decisions or to be involved in implementing them. So if you are asked to um, analyze how often people are late to work or work for their shifts and you compile the information based on the time cards, you're not going to be making a decision per se. You are collecting the information for your manager to then hand over to the manager with maybe a recommendation or letting the manager have the data that they can then use to make a decision. The other type of authority is functional authority, which involves greater delegation of authority than does staff authority. Functional authority is much more than just the authority to gather information or advise the manager. A person given functional authority can also make decisions that he or she would ordinarily not be able to make and implement them. Defined as, quote, the right which is delegated to an individual or a department to control sp specified processes, practices, policies, and other matters relating to activities undertaken by personnel in other departments. So usually functional authority is granted in order to bring the best possible expertise to bear on a problem or task. Functional authority seems to work well for many health and social work managers. It is a recognition that people, especially professionals, tend to have special areas of interest and expertise. Professional staff members often like being granted functional authority because in effect it says we can all learn from each other now and again. So when we are looking at staff authority versus functional authority, functional authority is a higher level of authority. Next we have delegate to groups. Sometimes it is useful to delegate certain tasks to groups of staff members. Two of the most common of these are committees and task forces. A primary advantage of delegating to groups of staff members is a pooling of knowledge and perspectives. Delegation to a group allows the work to be shared so that hopefully it does not fall too heavily on one individual. This can result in improved coordination among work units. Decisions that are made by the group are more likely to be acceptable to its members. So people have already bought in because they're part of the decision making process. The cons. A major disadvantage is how it diffuses personal responsibility. If it turns out badly, who is blamed? Individuals or the group? Well, the group. And with the group, you can point to, oh, the group leader is at fault. But if you're not the group leader, then you kind of hide in the corner and pretend it wasn't you. The number of people participating on them alone makes them expensive in terms of staff time. If you have seven people working on a task force or a committee, and they meet two hours every week. That's a lot of money and time being used that these people could be doing other jobs. Political maneuvering can result in poor decisions. For example, an unspoken understanding that I'll support your recommendation if you support mine can produce decisions that lack much real support from the majority of members. A compromise can result in decisions that, while politically feasible, really end up pleasing no one. 
And that's a that's an issue that we don't really think about when we hear the word compromise because compromise is usually a positive word. But in the business world, a compromise can be put in place that pleases no one. No one's happy, no one likes it, but it's the only thing everybody could agree on in terms of the policy that they're going to implement implement because everything else they were all not interested in. Committees, we usually think of a standing committee, that is one that is relatively permanent structure with an organization. It has been given a certain jurisdiction, that is, it has been determined what issues it should address and what decisions and or recommendations it is allowed to make and so forth. The committee is expected to investigate complaints of staff, attempt to resolve conflicts, and make recommendations to managers. The selection of the chairperson for a committee is especially critical. Committee chairpersons can exert considerable influence over the committee's actions and decisions. So the leader, you have to choose this person very carefully because they have a great deal of control over the committee. A good chairperson for a committee is someone who has a clear understanding of the purpose of every meeting and communicates it effectively to the members, knows how to set an agenda and keep the meeting on track promotes discussion and cuts it off when it is no longer productive, provides clarification as misunderstandings occur, encourages input from members who are less verbal or who dislike conflict, limits the, con the contributions of members who attempt to dominate discussions or impose their ideas on others, encourage discussion on issue but terminate it when it starts to become personalized, moves the meeting along by identifying when consensus has been achieved, meaning agreement, when more information is needed or when conflict cannot be resolved. And it ends the meeting promptly when the work of the committee is finished or when it appears that it will not be accomplished without scheduling another meeting. So you want a chairperson who has good communication skills, good time management skills. You want somebody who understands conflict remediation, who can you know bring the energy down in a room if the things get heated. You want someone who is collaborative, who wants to work with people, and who's not just going to dominate and say you're doing this and you're doing this and you're doing this and no one gets to say a, have a say in this. Task forces, sometimes we also hear the term ad hoc committee. It means essentially the same as a task force. Task, force, task forces are formed to address a specific problem. For example, a dramatic increase in staff turnover or a funding shortfall requiring the creation of a new client fee schedule or to complete some specific task. Task forces are much more narrowly focused. They are expected to remain on task and not become sidetracked until their job is finished. When it is, the task force should be disbanded. Task forces generally function less formally than committees and tend to make decisions more by consensus than by making and passing motions. A manager who forms a task group should look for a certain characteristic in selecting a task force leader. The ability to lead and maintain the group's focus, but in a fairly unauthoritarian way. Task force leaders should have excellent time management skills. When a manager decides to delegate authority to a standing committee or a task force to complete a certain task, his or her purpose in delegating it and what is being expected should be clearly understood by all con concerned. The authority delegated to the group must also be made clear. Is the group supposed to investigate and make recommendations to the manager that can be overruled, which is staff authority, or can actually make and implement decisions, which is functional authority? Managers often seek to form a group whose members have both an interest in the work and the expertise needed to do it. If the work of the committee or the task force is especially arduous or time-consuming, members may need to be relieved of some other duties as compensation for their service. So, <clears throat> what managerial system should be used? The capacity of staff members to tolerate and to accept the need for structure also influences the degree of organization that is optimal. Professional staff members are more likely to value professional autonomy and may be more resistive to many of the organizing efforts of a manager. However, such organizing methods can provide an acceptable mix of autonomy and structure for professionals.
the personalities of managers themselves help to determine the amount of organizing that is optimal for a work setting. Now here are some um, the elements of what a good boss is and this is based on a um, survey that was done by this organization. Integrity and respect, vision and decisions, open-minded and has a good sense of humor, honest and visible, be a non-blamer. If someone is only looking who they can pin the blame on, they're not really looking to see how to fix the problem. Have motivation, know how to motivate and have clear goals. And last, balance the strictness and lenience of the policies. You know, as a boss, you may want your employees to stay till 5 o'clock every day. But on a Friday in the summer, you might say, you know what, everybody leaves at 3 today. You're going to have great morale after that. And if you have the ability or the authority to do that, that's a great way of ensuring that your staff is going to be um, much happier with your management style. So that's it for today. If you have any questions, please email or text me. Otherwise, um, if you're not in one of my classes, please feel free to leave me a comment. Have a great day and we'll see you next time.